Hello, welcome to Academia Programatorilor. My name is Tudor and I've been working as a Java software engineer since 2018. I prepared this Java development beginner's course to help you logically understand the Java programming language syntax. By walking through this course with me, you'll understand the basics of programming through practice and you won't need to search the internet for information, which could easily take you off course. In this course, you will have access to all the necessary materials in order for you to understand from scratch the basics of Java development and you will learn how to implement them through lots and lots of practice. Through this practice, by the end of this course, you will already have your first running applications. Let's start from the beginning. What is Java? Java is a platform-independent object-oriented programming language. You can run it on any operating system, Windows, Mac or Linux, and its purpose is to create a large variety of products. Web applications, Android applications, iOS applications and desktop applications. Our courses are structured so that every person could understand this programming language even though he or she interacted up until now with the software domain or not. This course contains many modules, each of them being structured using the 80-20 rule, which means that together we will walk through the theoretical stuff in a 20% proportion, and the rest of 80% will consist in practical demonstrations and exercises which will help us understand the software logic and write in time more complex code. So if you want to start a career in the software development industry, which nowadays represents the future, you arrive to the perfect starting place. In the next videos, we will install together all the necessary software for you to be able to successfully write and run your own Java applications, so I invite you to take your first steps with me into this industry. In this course, we will learn the Java development notions. A very good advantage is that those notions are general. What do I mean by that? Even though we will learn them using the Java programming language, those notions can perfectly be applied in many of the most wanted programming languages up to date. Any change you will eventually feel the need to make after this course, what you will have already learned will be a perfect foundation for you to make a switch to any other programming language. In the first lessons, we will talk about the structure of a Java application. We will install all the necessary software and we will write our own first Java applications. We will talk about data types, variables and operators, and we will interact with the users which will use our application through user input. We will learn about decision making, which affects the way our application will behave, and we will learn how to use loops, lists, arrays and vectors. We will learn what a method is and how to use it, and we will dive into a more advanced topic, which is recursion. At the end, I have prepared three Java games for you, which we will write together from scratch. In each lesson, I will explain you the theory, and I will add many practical examples, after which you will have many available exercises to strengthen your knowledge and coding skills. See you in the next video. Hello, in this video, we are going to install all the necessary software to run a Java project. As I said in the last video, we will need to install two things, Java Development Kit and IntelliJ. Let's start by opening Google Chrome or any other browser and inside our Google search bar we will write download IntelliJ. Here we can see multiple links. We have to be careful not to press the one that says Ultimate Edition. We have to download a normal one. We can press this link and here we will be asked what version of IntelliJ we want to download. There are two versions, Ultimate and Community. We will download the Community Edition because the Ultimate must be paid. We will press the Download button and we will wait for our program to be downloaded. After the downloading is complete, we will proceed to the installation. Here we will have to press Next if you want, you can select the folder in which the program will be installed. I will leave it as it is and press Next. And here you don't have to select anything, only if you want to create a desktop icon. So I will press Next and Install. Now we will wait for our installation to be finished. Now that the installation is complete, I can press this button run IntelliJ IDEA Community Edition and press Finished. I will confirm and press Continue. 
And now this window will appear. I will press New Project. And here you can see a dropdown, Project SDK. I already have Java 11 installed, the Java Development Kit 11. You will not have this option here. In order to download the Java Development Kit, you can press this drop down button and select Download JDK. Here another window will pop up in which you can select which Java Development Kit version you want to download. You can select the version 11 for instance, from Amazon Coreto, you don't have to change this, and press Download. Now that you have installed the Java Development Kit, you have to make sure you select that JDK you just downloaded, you press Next, Next, you give your project a name, my first project, and press Finished. Now everything looks good. In the next video, we will write together our first project. Before we move on to the next video, you can see that in this download window, you can also select the Mac version or the Linux version. The steps are the same as for Windows. You have to download the Community Edition and then follow the steps I just did in this video. Hello, now that we have downloaded all the necessary programs, let's write our first project. Once you double click on IntelliJ, this window will appear. To create a new project, we will click on the New Project button. Here, by default, the IntelliJ has already seen the Java Development Kit that we installed in the previous video and selected it. We will continue to click Next. Here, we don't have to select anything, we will click Next. And here, we will have to give our project a name. Let's call it My First. project. We will press finish and our project will be generated. If after creating your project nothing will appear on the left side of the screen, we have a button here that says project. If we click on it, we will immediately see on the left side of the screen the complete structure of our project. We will work on the source folder. The first thing we need to do is create a class. We will press right click on the source folder, new Java class. Let's call it my first class. We can see that the .java extension file has been created. The content of our class will be between those two braces. In order to work, we will have to declare a main method, which looks like this. We will write public static void main string args. We will open again two braces. All we need to work on will be inside this main method. The first instruction to display a message on the console looks like this. We will write system dot out that print line. After the print line keyword, we will have to open two parentheses. Inside these parentheses, we have to write the message that we want to be printed. Whenever we want to display a message on the console, we will have to put it in quotes. So we will open two quotes, and if we press the quotation marks on the keyboard, the final quotation mark will also be generated. Let's write hello everyone here. After each instruction that we want to display, it is mandatory to put a semicolon at the end. If we don't do this, we can see that the IntelliJ suggests that we have a problem, highlighted in red. Now let's run our program. Click on this green triangle next to the main method and click run my first class. We can see that at the bottom appeared the console in which was printed the message that we passed in the parentheses of our system out print line instruction. Let's display another message using the same instruction. We will write system out print line. 
Again, our message will have to be in quotes. Let's write, this is the second instruction that I have executed. Mandatory at the end, never forget, we will have to write a semicolon. If we run our application again, we can see that both our instructions have been executed from top to bottom. The first time we printed hello everyone and the second time this is the second instruction that I have executed. After executing each system of line instruction, we can see that a message passed in the quotation marks has been printed in the console, after which our cursor went down to the next row and printed the second sentence. We have another instruction called system out print. Let's write it also. System dot out dot print. No line this time. Inside this parenthesis, we will write another sentence. Let's write my name is. We will run the application. And now we can see that after executing instruction 2, the text my name is was printed on the console, after which our program ended. Let's say we want to display another message through the system out print instruction. Let's write our name, Tudor. System out print Tudor. At the end, semicolon. When we run the application, we can see that instruction 3 and 4 were executed on the same row. What is the difference between system out print and system out print line? Exactly that. When we execute a system out print line instruction, our message placed in parentheses will be printed, after which our cursor will move to the next line. When we execute a print instruction, this time our message my name is, which was put in our first instruction, was printed, but the second message was printed on the same line. Because the system out print statement prints what we give it in parentheses, but our cursor stays on the same row. Automatically, by printing another instruction after that, it will be printed on the same line and the cursor will also remain on that line. Let's now talk about Java data types. In the real world, we use information. This information can be text, it can be numbers, it can be truth values or characters. When I say my name is Tudor, I just said a text. When I say 12334.4, I'm saying some numbers. True or false may be the only possible values for truth and A, B, C, X, Y, Z may be letters, characters. In programming, our text will be written as a string, and it must be enclosed in double quotes, at the beginning and at the end. Just as you saw that we passed our messages in the system out print and system out print line instructions. Truth values are boolean, and there can be only two values for that, true or false. Our letters will be of type character, and these, unlike strings, must always be enclosed in single quotes, not double quotes. If I say lowercase a or uppercase a, these are characters. One can also be registered by our compiler as a character. This also applies to special signs. Numbers in Java can be of several types. They can be integers of type int. I can say minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. We can also have double numbers, which are written with a dot. For example, let's say 2.32, 55.3, and so on. Float numbers are also used to encapsulate fraction values, but it is mandatory to write the letter F at the end of the value. Long numbers can encapsulate larger values, and the letter L must be specified at the end each time. Any int type number can have values from minus 2,147,000,000 to plus 2 billion 147 million. If we want to use a larger number than that, we'll have to use the long data type. Let's go back to IntelliJ. 
When we used our last print statement, our cursor remained automatically after the last word printed. That is, after Tudor. To move the cursor to the next row, we can use an empty system out print line instruction. We can write system dot out dot print line, open parentheses and leave it as it is. But instead of writing that, we have an abbreviation to use these instructions. We can write the letters S O U T and after that we just have to press the tab key. By doing this, our system out print line instruction will be automatically generated for us. Let's run the application. The moment I run the application, I won't have anything different here. Instead, in the computer's memory, our cursor moved to the next row. In the console, we can print all the data types we've talked about so far. So far, you've seen that we can print strings. We can also print numbers. We can print the numbers 1 and 999, for instance. We will write a SOUT tab 1. SOUT tab 999. We can also print double numbers. System out print line 2.45. System out print line, we can print float numbers. 2.45 F. We can also print long numbers. Let's write a system out print line. Here we will pass a number that exceeds the limit of 2,147,000,000. Here, we see a problem underlined in red. We are trying to print an integer number that is too large, too big. If we put the letter L at the end, our problem will be solved. Let's run the application. Here, we also have a button that does that. Running the application again, we see that all our information was printed in the console. Truth values, as I said, can be of two types. We can either have true or false. Let's print them. System out print line true. System out print line false. If we run the application again, we will see the value true and false printed in our console also. Let's also print two characters. We will press the single quote button. We will write A. We can see that inside those single quotes we will only be allowed to write a single letter. Let's print A. Let's print percent. If we run the application again, we will also see these characters in the console. In the next video, we will talk about variables. Hello. In this video, we will talk about variables. A variable is a data storage container that our program can manipulate. The term variable comes from the fact that it can change its content during our program. We can declare a variable for all the types of data that we've talked about so far. The moment we want to create a variable, we must first determine what type of data it will store. Let's go back to IntelliJ. I have already created a new project and I called it variables. Let's create together a new class and name it variables. Right click new Java class variables. Inside this class we will also write a main method psvm tab. You already know this abbreviation. When we want to declare a text variable we must first specify the data type which in this case is string. We will write string. Let's call our variable name. This string name will be equal to our value. Here in quotation marks you can enter your name. I'm gonna say Tudor. At the end we must write a semicolon as you already know. String name is the declaration of my variable. Equals the value Tudor represents the initialization of my variable. In my box called name, 
I just put the value Tudor. I can use this box to print its value. I can write a system out print line. And here, instead of the value of my name, I can use directly my variable that encapsulates that information. I can write n, and you can see that IntelliJ already suggests you that you have this variable name available. If I run the application, the contents of my variable will be printed. If I printed the variable name, I can see its value in the console. Let's declare another variable that contains the following text. I like Java. By the way, this is a comment, as you already know. It is ignored by the compiler. The data type is text, so we will automatically need to encapsulate that value in a string variable. We can write string, after which we will give a name to our variable. I will call it my text. As a general convention, the names of the variables must be written in camel case. Camel case means that the first word will always start with a lowercase letter and any other word that will be written next to my word will start with a capital letter. Now I can initialize my variable. I will write equals I like Java at the end semicolon. To print my text, I can use the system out print line in which I will pass my variable my text. System out print line my text. If I run the program, the contents of my variable will be printed again. We will never be allowed to declare two variables with the same name. If I try to declare another string variable that is called my text, let's say I will write string my text equals text2, we can see that I'm not allowed, because I already declared a variable with this name. The variables, as I said at the beginning of the video, can also be changed. First, I declare the my text variable, which I initialize it with the value I like Java and printed it. That's why I like Java appeared in the console. My variable, as I said, can be changed. After I printed it, I can type my text equals new text. If I try to print my text again, system out print line, my text, and run the application, the modified value will appear in the console. The first time, I initialized my variable with the value I like Java, after which I printed it. After that, I overwrote my text I like Java with my new text and printed it again. Let's declare a variable for each data type we know. If we want to declare an integer variable, we will write int my integer equals 100. I can also put this number inside the system out print line instruction. System out print line my integer. If I run the application, I can see my number here. For double data types, we will have a double variable. I can write double and name my variable my double number, which is equal to 55.6. Likewise, I can print my double number. I can also declare and initialize a float variable. I can say float my float number equals to 44.4. .4. If I put a semicolon here, the compiler will show me I have an error. If you remember, each time you use a float number, you must specify the letter F at the end. So I will write 44.4F. .4 this number can also be printed. If I run the application, I can see all my values printed in the console. Characters can be encapsulated in char type variables. I will write char letter 
is equal to, and if you remember from the previous video, the characters must always be specified in single quotes. I will open my single quote and I will type the letter A. I can also print that character, that letter. Truth values can be encapsulated in boolean variables. I will write boolean value true. If I print it, it will print true for me. In conclusion, every time I want to declare a variable, I will have to specify the data type to give it a name of my choice, convenient to always be camel case, after which to initialize it, to write equals the value. I will never be allowed to declare, for example, an int test variable, in which to start inserting another type of data, such as string, let's say text. My compiler will show that it is a problem. Also, I can declare a variable of type string test2 in which I will try to put a number, for instance 2, and so on. The specified data type must always be the initialized value. In the next video, we will do some exercises in which we will use variables. Hello, in this video we will do some exercises in which we will use variables. I have already created a new project which I called variables exercises. Let's make a new class together and call it exercises. Right click new Java class exercises. Inside this class we will write a main method psvm tab. You already know this. Here I will paste some exercises in some comments. First of all, I want the next thing. Declare a variable of type character and initialize it with the value star. Secondly, declare a variable of type you decide which type and initialize it with the value 3.14. You need to think about what kind of data this falls into. You have two possible options. In the third line, I want you to declare a variable of type boolean and initialize it with whichever value you want. Lastly, print all the variables on the same line and on different lines. Think of the two instructions that you need to use. You can pause this video, after which we will write the exercises together. First of all, to declare a character variable, we must write char and give a name to our variable, let's call it star, equals to single quotes star. At the end, we will always write a semicolon. In what type of data can the number 3.14 be included? It can be either a double or a float. So I have two possible options. I can write double my double number equals to 3.14 and I can also write float my float number equals 3.14 f. To declare a boolean variable we must write boolean my boolean equals one of the two possible cases. It can be either true or false. Any other value will not work. So we will write false. I can see I made a mistake here. I wrote the letter L instead of a semicolon. As we work, we will have cases in which our code will not be formatted nicely and will be messy. To format our text, to see it aligned nicely, we can press the keyboard shortcut Ctrl, Alt and the letter L. The compiler will align our code nicely and will insert a pause between variable names, equals and their values. To print all of our variables on the same row, we can use the system out print statement. We will write an S out, delete the line at the end and we will pass our variable name star. Again, I will have a system out print. 
my double number. System of print, my float number, system out print, my boolean. And if I run my program, we will see that all of our variables will be printed on the same line. To move to the next line, we will write an empty system out print line. After this, we can do the second part of the exercise and print all of our variables in different rows. We will write a system out print line this time for each variable. If I now ran the program, I will see that each of my variables was printed on the different row. I will now write another exercise in which I want you to declare and initialize two int type variables, after which you can print on the console their sum, difference, the multiplication and their division. Pause the video and try and after that we will solve the exercise together. Let's declare together two int variables. We will write int number one equals, for instance, 10, and int number two equals three. To display the sum of the two numbers on the console, we will write a system out print line, number one plus number two. And I have a small typo here. And if I run the application now, you can see that the sum was printed at the end. 10 plus 3 equals 13. To display the difference, we will write a system out print line, in which I will write number 1 minus number 2. To display the division, I can write system out print line in which I can say number one divided by number two. For the multiplication, again, system out print line number one times star number two. Again, press Ctrl Alt L to format our code. If we execute our program, we can see that the sum 13 was printed, the difference 7 was printed, instead the division was 3. Whenever we divide an integer number by another integer number, its result will not be a double type. It will also be an integer type. 10 divided by 3 will give us 3 period 3. Therefore, the result will be the integer value 3. Multiplication also printed us the value 30. In this exercise, we use mathematical operators. Plus, minus, times and division. In the next video, we will talk about all types of Java operators. Hello! In programming, operators can be of several types. In the last video, we used arithmetic operators. An expression consists in an operator and an operand. An operator indicates what operation we want to apply to the operands. The operators are special symbols which perform different kinds of operations. The Java programming language consists in the following operators, arithmetical, relational, logical, assignment and other operators. In programming, arithmetic operators can be addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulus, increment and decrement. We used the addition, subtraction, multiplication and division in the previous video and we understood how they work. If in the last video 10 divided by 3 gave us the full value 3, 10 modulo 3 will return the rest of the division. The increment can be used when we want to increment the value of a variable by 1. 
When I have a variable of type int a equals 10, for instance, if I write a++, my value will become 11. I also have an operator for decrementing. If I write a minus minus, my number will be equal to that number minus 1. Relational operators are used when we want to return truth values. When we want to check if two numbers are equal, we will write the number a equals equals b. A single equal means assignment, as we saw in declaring variables when we wrote int a equals 2. The value 2 was assigned to the variable a. 2 equals means comparison. We can also check the inequality condition of two variables. If I write 2 exclamation point equal 3, this comparison will also return a boolean, which will be true, because 2 is different from 3. If I say 2 is greater than 3, a false result will automatically be returned. If I say 2 less than 3, it will return true because 2 is less than 3. Less or equal or greater or equal are used in the same context that we used them in mathematics. If I say 2 greater than or equal to 2, it will return true, because I have a case where 2 is equal to 2. Logical operators can be AND, OR, or negation. The AND operator is used when we want to return the truth value of two conditions. If both conditions are true, then our final result will also be true. If only one condition is true and another is false, then the end result will be false. Same goes if both are false. The OR operator is used when we want to make sure that at least one of the two or more conditions is true. If I have a true condition OR a false condition, then my final result will automatically be true. If I have two false conditions separated by the OR operator, then my final result will be false. Negation is used to reverse the truth values of a condition. The assignment operators are the following. We saw that the equal is used to put a certain value in a variable. Plus equals is used to increment a certain value with a number we specified after. If we write that our variable c plus equals a, it is equivalent to saying that c is equal to c plus a. The same goes for the minus. We also have equal multiplication and equal division that use the same principle as addition and subtraction. The same goes for the modulus. Let's go to IntelliJ and test some cases. I created a new project that I named operators. Let's put together in the source folder a new class, which we will call operators. Right-click new Java class, operators. Here we will write our main method, psvm tab. First, let's talk about mathematical operators. As we've seen, they can be the following, plus, minus, times, slash, and modulus. If I say a system out print line 10 plus 10, my result will be 20. If I have system out print line 100 minus 88, my result will be 12. If I have a system out print line 100 times 3, my result will be 300. For instance, if I have 7 divided by 2, my result will be 3. That is the whole part of the result. If I have a system out print line 7 modulo 2, and I run the application, the result of this operation will be the rest of the division of 7 to 2, which is 1. These are the mathematical operators. Next, let's talk about relational operators. First, we have the equality operator. If I write system out print line 7 is equal to 9, 2 equals this time because we want to check the equality, 
We run the program and we can say that false will be printed in the console. If I write 7 is equal to 7, then of course true will be printed in the console. Likewise, we have the inequality operator. When I write a system out print line, 7 is different, exclamation point equals, then 7, my final result will be false, because 7 is not different than 7. But instead, when I say 7 is different than 9, my result will be true, because of course 7 is different than 9. I can also combine the mathematical operators with the relational operators. If I write, for instance, system out print line, 4 plus 4 is less than 10, my result will be true because 8 is less than 10. If I say system out print line, 8 is less or equal to 8, I can see that the final result will be true, because I have a case where 8 is equal to 8. Likewise, I have the case when I can check the condition that 8 is greater or equal to 8. My result will also be true. Next, we will test the logical operators. As I said, logical operators are used when we want to find out the truth value of two conditions. If I say, for instance, system out print line, 7 is less than 10 and 6 is less than 10, I can run the application and I can see that my end result will be true because both conditions are met. 7 is indeed less than 10 and 6 is less than 10. If I change my statement and say 7 is less than 10 and 100 is less than 10, my end result will be false, because both specify conditions are not met. The AND operator returns true when both conditions are true. The OR operator, on the other hand, will return true when at least one of my conditions is true. If I have a system out print line, 100 is less than 1000, or 9 is greater than 100, my end result will be true, because I have in this structure a case that will return true, the first one. Also, the negation operator returns the exact opposite of a truth value. If I said, for instance, system out print line, true, with an exclamation point in front, I can see that the value false will be printed. Let's say, in parentheses, 2 is bigger than 10. This result will be false. Negating this false, my final result will be true. Next, let's test the assignment operators. In the previous videos, we used the equal operator. When we wrote int number equals 5, the value 5 was inserted in our variable called number which is of type int. If we want to increment our number by 1, we can use the instruction number plus plus. This instruction will increment our number by 1 and we will have the result 6. Let's print this result. System of print line number. We can see that the value 6 was printed here in the console. If let's say I were to increment this number 3 times by 1, of course, my final result will be 8. Also, if I declare another number, int number 2 equals 8, if we write number 2 minus minus, we can print that number, and our final result will be 7. As you can see here in the console. Let's now declare another variable int number 3, which is equal to the value 10. If we want to bring to our number another 20, we can say number 3 plus equals 20. If we print it, 
we can run the application. We will have the result 50. The first time we declared our variable number 3 with the value 10. Adding 20, our result was printed and it printed us 30. After that, we can increment it one more time with another 20. Let's say number 3 plus equals 20 again. If I'm gonna print again my number, number 3, we will now see the value 50. This logic also applies to all operators of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division and modulus. I can write number 3 minus equal 20, divided equal 20, times equal 20 and modulus equal 20. In the next video we will talk about concatenation and learn a new way to print our variables to the console. Hi, in this video we will talk about another way to print our variables in the console. I have already opened a new project and I called it concatenation. Let's create a new class together in the source folder and call it concatenation exercises. We will also make a main method, psvm tab, and inside it let's declare a variable for each known data type. We will write together int number equals 10, string text equals test, double double number equals 11.1, float float number equals 11.1 f boolean truth equals true and char c equals star if we want to print our variables in the form of a text we can use a system out print line in which to enter the text my string variable has the value and I will get out of the string and continue to pass plus the name of my string variable which is text. I will run the application and we can see that my template my string variable has the value test was printed in the console. Here I forgot to put a white space. We can do this for each type of data we declared above. We can write a system out print line. My number is plus number. I can write again a system out print line in which I can say double number is my double number. The same goes for float. We can copy and paste this line and modify it. Float number is my float number. Also the same goes for character. System of print line I have declared a character with the value plus my character, which is C. If we execute our program, we can see that our variables have been concatenated to our text. The plus operator, used with numerical values, has the responsibility to add them. On the other hand, the plus operator, applied to strings, has the responsibility to concatenate them, to glue them. So far, we've talked about the system out print line and system out print statements. We have another instruction called system out print f. Print f stands for format. System out print f is used when we want to include in our structure more concatenations, more pluses. We can write system dot out dot print f and the first thing that will need to be passed 
to my instruction is the way I want my printed text to look. I want it to appear in the shape of I have declared a string variable with the value x. To replace the x with our string, we will need to pass a comma after our template and specify the name of our variable. We called our variable text. Also, the x will have to be replaced with a sequence of characters that will be used by our compiler to interpret the fact that the next thing passed after the comma will be a string. For this, the x will be replaced by percent %s. In the end, as after any other operation, we'll put a semicolon. And if we run our program, we can see that our text I have declared a string variable with the value test has been printed. Our percent %s has been replaced by our string value. Let's write another system out print f. There is also an abbreviation for that. We will write s-o-u-f and press tab. Here I will write I have declared an int variable with the value again x. Further, I will pass my number number. And when this variable is of type int, I will have to replace my x with a percent %d, which stands for decimal. I will run the application again. And we can see that our int variable has been passed to our template. Between the two system out print f instructions, we can also see that our compiler does not move to the next line. For this, we will have to introduce an empty system out print line between them. We will write SOUT tab. If we run again, our sentences will be printed on different rows. To use a double or a float number, we can write system out print f. I have declared a double variable with the value. This time I will write percent %f, after which, after a comma, we will write our double number. Before we run our application again, let's also write an empty system out print line. As you can see, I have declared a bubble variable with the value 11.1. .1. Let's change that to double. Also, there is no rule that says we need to pass only a single variable within a template. If I wrote here I am declaring a double variable with the value percent %f, I'm also allowed to continue my text. And the string with the value and to replace a string here we will write percent %s as you already know. Now after my double number I will have to pass the variable of type text of type string which is text. If we run our application we can see that both our variables were inserted in my string template. I have declared a double variable with the value 11.1 .1 and a string with the value test. To print a boolean, we will have to use SOUF and we will write we are declaring a boolean and this time I will use percent %b. After a comma, I will specify my boolean, which I called truth. We can see that we are declaring a boolean true. Of course, we didn't use a system out print line to go to the next row. So let's do that. Now we can see all of our sentences printed on different rows. In the following video, we will do some exercises with operators in which we will use all three ways of printing. Hello, so far we have worked with various data types variables and operators, and we have learned how to display information on the console. All we have done so far has been to provide the user the information about our data. In the course presentation, you learned that Java is an object-oriented programming language. 
More specifically, this means that in our program we can use classes and objects. So far, we have created a class every time to work inside it. In an application, we will have to offer the user the possibility to communicate with us, to send us information. In the previous clips, we found out that Java Runtime Environment has a series of predefined classes brought when we downloaded the Java Development Kit whose functionality we can use. One of those classes is the Scanner class, whose role is to offer the user the possibility to enter information in the console so we can be further processed and used by us. Based on this class, we will be able to create an object. This is done in a similar way to the one we have used to declare and initialize our variables. First, we will need to specify the type of data. We want to initialize a scanner type. Therefore, the specified data type will have to be the scanner class. In our main method, we will write scanner. Here, we can see all kinds of different classes brought from the Java runtime environment. We will have to select the first one, the scanner class from the package java.util. We will press enter. We can see that in our application, the scanner class was imported from the Java runtime environment. More specifically, from the package java.util. This text appears automatically and we must not modify or delete it. We specify the data type scanner. And now we will have to give a name to our object. We will call it reader. Next, we will use the equals operator. And to its right, we will have to initialize a new scanner object. In Java, the initialization of a new object is done by the keyword new. We will write new. And after that, as IntelliJ suggested, we will specify the class name again. We will write scanner. In its parentheses, we will have to write the following keywords. System.in Now I have just declared and initialized a scanner object. In Java, objects can have behavior. They can have functionalities that we, the programmers, can use to achieve our goals. The functionalities of the scanner class that we had just defined and initialized are to allow the user to enter information to the console. The user can enter any type of data that we've talked about so far in this course. He can do so by calling the object methods. If you want the user to enter a text, we will have to use the next line method. We will define a string variable that we initialize through the next line method of our scanner class. We will write string inserted text is equal to the object name, which is reader, dot next line. Let's display a corresponding message before we do that. Let's write a system of print line. Please enter a text. Now we will run our application. And this time, we can see that the process was not finished with exit code 0. After printing this message, please enter a text, the application will now wait for us to enter any information in the console. The next line method has the role of reading a string. Therefore, we will have to enter a value of a string at the console, after which we will press enter. We will write demo text. We can see that our application did nothing else. Why? Because I did absolutely nothing with the text I have just entered that was encapsulated in my inserted text variable. If after reading the text on the console, I will make a system out print line in which to put my variable, things will be different. Let's display a system out print line. You entered the text. plus inserted text. Let's run our application again. Again, the message please enter a text will be displayed. Let's say this time, hello everyone. I will press enter. 
After which, we can see that message you enter the text hello everyone was printed. My text entered in the console was encapsulated in a string variable inserted text after which I was able to use it in my business logic. Just as I read a text from the console, I can read any type of data using the appropriate method. The scanner class has several methods for reading each type of data. If I want to read an int, an integer for instance, I will use the next int method. Let's comment on reading our text and display a following message. System of print line. Please enter a number. To read an integer, we will declare an int variable inserted number, which will be equal to my scanner object, which I called reader. Dot, and here I can see that IntelliJ suggests the method next int. After that, again I can write a system of print line. You have entered the number plus inserted number. I will run the application and the program will ask me to enter a number. I will enter 55. You have entered the number 55. If I run the application again and it will wait for me to enter an integer and I will enter a text, let's say test, the application will crack because the string test cannot be encapsulated in an int variable. Let's comment on our reading again. To read a double number, I will first print a system out print line, please enter a double number. Here we will use the next double method. Double inserted double will be equal to my reader dot next double. We will display a message system of print line you have entered the double number plus inserted double. We will run the application again and our application is now waiting for us to provide a double number. I will enter 3.45 after which a message will be displayed. You have entered the double number 3.45. From one computer to another, reading double numbers may be different. We may have cases where our double number must be entered with a dot, as I just did earlier. If your application cracks, it means that you will have to replace the dot with a comma. You must write 3 comma 45. In my case, the application cracks. This inconsistency depends on one computer to another. So let's go further. To read a float number, we will display a message. Please enter a float number and we will write float inserted float is equal to my reader dot you guessed next float. You have entered the float number inserted float. Again I will run my application. I will provide 10.1 and I have just entered the flow number 10.1. Let's comment our code. To read a long number, we will use the next long method. Let's display a message. System of print line, please provide a long number. We will write long, long number is equal to reader dot next long. We will also write a system of print line. You entered the long number plus long number. We will run again our application. We will provide 9999999999 and we can see that it also printed whichever number I just entered here. 
To read a boolean, we will use the next boolean method. We will write a system of print line. Please enter a boolean. We will write boolean. My boolean is equal to reader dot next boolean. System of print line, you have entered a boolean plus my boolean. I will run the application. I will provide true. I have just entered true. I will provide false. I just entered false. I will provide anything else, maybe, and my application will crack. I will only be allowed to provide true or false in the case of this method. Again, I will comment my code. In characters, things will be a little different. For this, we will use two methods. If we want to enter a character from the keyboard, we will display a message. System of print line, please enter a char value. We will declare a variable of type char inserted character will be equal to reader and here we will not have any next char method as you can see we will have to use the method next which will bring us the first word entered from the keyboard after which we will pass that again and use the following method char at and in its parentheses we will have to pass the index 0 this chain of methods will return us in the first instance the first word entered from the keyboard after which it will return its first character as you have seen before it's reading from the console it is recommended to display to the user an appropriate message to know what to do please enter a char value let's also print our letter provided char plus inserted character I will run the application insert the letter B provided char B in Java we have a bug although we can use our scanner object to make multiple readings from the console when our reader will be used to read both a text and a number, our application is possible to crack. That is why it is recommended to declare a scanner for each type of data that you want to read from the keyboard. Want to read text values and want to read numeric values. If we uncomment all of our code, and somewhere in the middle we will try to do another text reading after we have already read a number we will see that we will have a problem I will copy the reading of the text and I will paste it again just between the reading of an int and a float let's write inserted text 2 and 2 we will run our program again and my application says please enter a text hello you have entered the text hello Please enter a number, 12. Please enter a float number. As you can see, after the reading of my integer number, my program ignored those lines of code and jumped right to the reading of my float number. To solve this problem, we can define another scanner object. I will say scanner reader text is equal to new scanner system.in my default reader will be used to read numeric type values and the text reader will be used when I want to read text so let's replace everything reader text next line I will leave the number with my initial reader Again, the reading of my text will be done through my reader text object, inserted float with my initial reader, same goes for long, 
and also let's use our text reader for the characters. Here I just have a little problem because this line of code should have been right above the reading of my float. Now it's all in order. Again, let's run our application. I will provide a text, hi, enter the text hi. Number 12, I enter the number 12. Here, as you can see, I will be allowed to enter my text now. Hi, again. You enter the text hi again. Please enter a flow number. 13. You have entered the flow number 13. Provide a long. Whatever I just entered here. Provide a boolean. True. You have entered the boolean. True. Please enter a char value. Star. Provide a char star. Now my application finished. So again, every time you want to read different kinds of data from this console, you will have to use a specific reader for each type. Hello, in this video we will do some exercises in which we will practice the reading from the console. Let's start with the first exercise. Print the following text. What profession do you want to have the next year? The user must enter the response in the console. The text keep up the good work and next year you will be a response will be printed in the console. Pause this video after which we will solve the exercise together. To read a value from the console we will first need a scanner object. We will write scanner and we will import the scanner class from the package java util and now we have to give a name to our scanner. We will call it sc equals new scanner system dot in. Let's display the required message on the console. We will write a system out print line. What profession do you want to have the next year? To read the desired profession from the console, we will declare a variable of type string desired profession, which will be equal to sc, the name of our scanner, dot next line. Next, we will write a message system out print line, keep up the good work, and next year you will be a desired profession. Let's run the application. The application will ask us what profession we want. We will introduce software developer. We can see the message keep up the good work and next year you will become a software developer. Let's comment on our solution and go to exercise 2. Write a program that prints the following text. Welcome to the system. How old are you? The user will enter the response in the console and it will be stored in a variable. The text, oh, I see your response years old will be printed in the console. Pause the video and try, after which we will solve the exercise together. Again, we will need a scanner object and for that we will write scanner and let's name our scanner reader equals new scanner system dot in. Let's print the message. System out print line, welcome to the system. How old are you? Our result will be encapsulated in an int variable. We will have int h equals to my scanner object which I named reader dot next int. At the end we will print a message. System out print line. Oh, I see. Your plus age plus years old. Let's run our program. Welcome to the system. How old are you? I'm 26. Oh, I see, you're 26 years old. Another way to display this message would be through a system outprint f instruction. 
we will write system out print f o i c your percent d years old after the comma we will specify our variable age if we run our program we will see the text welcome to the system how old are you i'm 19. the first time our message was printed through concatenation and the second time by our system out print f instruction here i have a little typo let's comment the exercise and move on to the next Write a program that asks the user for his or her sex by specifying only the values M or F. Store the user's response in a specific variable and print the text you picked that response. Pause this video, after which we will solve the exercise together. Given that our program requires us to enter a single letter, the most appropriate variable to encapsulate that will be a char. We will define a scanner to read our letter. Scanner reader equals new scanner system dot in. We will display a corresponding message. System out print line. Please enter your sex. M or F. After the program displays this message, we will define a char gender which will be equal to our reader dot next to return the first word entered from the keyboard and next we will write dot char at zero to return the first letter of that word. We will then display a system of print line in which we will write you picked plus gender. We can also write a system out print f in which we will write u picked percent c. After the comma we will specify our variable gender. Let's run the application. Our program will ask us to enter our gender. We will write m after which both our messages will be printed. Let's comment this exercise and move on to the fourth one. The user must enter three numbers. Save the specific numbers in three variables. Print their sum, difference, multiplication and average on different rows. The format should be tx is equal to y, where x represents the sum, difference, multiplication and average and y represents the result. All these messages must be printed in a single system out print f instruction. As a hint, to move on to the next row, you can use backward slash n. Pause the video and try, and after that, we will solve the exercise together. To read our numbers from the console, we will need a scanner. Just like in each exercise, we will write scanner reader equals new scanner system dot in. Let's display a corresponding message. System out print line, enter the first number. We can also copy this line and paste it two more times. Enter the second number and enter the third number. After each message, we will read that number from the console. int n1 will be equal to reader dot next int the same goes for the second one int n2 equals reader next int and also the third now we will have to calculate the sum the difference the multiplication and the average let's declare a variable for all four we will write int sum equals n1 plus n2 plus n3 int diff equals n1 minus n2 minus n3 int product will be equal to n1 
times n2 times n3 and int average will be equal to our sum divided by 3 because we have 3 numbers. In fact, here we have a division, so let's make this average a double in order to have a more precise response. At the end, in order to show our results on different rows using the same instruction, we will write a single system out print f in which we will enter our template. The sum is equal to percent %d backwards slash n to move on to the next row. The difference is equal to percent %d again backwards slash n. The product is equal to again percent %d backwards slash n and for the average we will write the average is equal to and this time we will use a percent %f because the average is a double number. After a comma we will specify our results. We have sum, diff, product and average. Let's run our program. We will enter our numbers 10, 2 and 3. The sum will be equal to 15, the difference will be equal to 5, the product will be 60 and the average will be 2. Let's comment on our exercise and move on to the last one. Write a program that asks the user to enter the current temperature in Celsius degrees and prints the result in Fahrenheit degrees. You can search for the formula on Google. If you'll have problems, we will solve the exercise together. Pause the video and try. Let's solve the exercise. To enter the Celsius degrees from the console, we will need a scanner. We will write scanner reader equals new scanner system.in. We will display a corresponding message. System out print line enter the temperature in Celsius degrees. We will enter it and encapsulate it in a variable of type int Celsius degrees, which will be equal to our scanner object reader dot next int. Once we have entered the Celsius degrees, we will have to calculate the Fahrenheit degrees using our formula. You will be able to write double Fahrenheit degrees, which will be equal to our Celsius degrees times 9 over 5 plus 32. If we will leave the exercise like this, we will have a problem. Because here I am trying to divide 9 by 5. I'm trying to divide two integers number, which will always return me also an integer number. 9 divided by 5 will be equal to 1. To solve that, we have to divide two double numbers. We will write 9.0 divided by 5.0. Now let's print our message. We will write a system out print line. The result in Fahrenheit degrees is equal to plus Fahrenheit degrees. Let's test our application. We entered 0 Celsius degrees and our result in Fahrenheit degrees is equal to 32.0. Let's also enter 100 Celsius degrees. This one will be equal to 212 Fahrenheit degrees. In the next video, we will continue to write some exercises in which we will read from the console. Hi! In this video, we will talk about decision-making instructions. The programming of a computer is based on what is called an algorithm. An algorithm is a sequence of steps that the computer must take to perform a certain task or thing. We also use algorithms in real life without us even knowing it. 
Suppose we walk on the street and we want to cross the road and we reach a traffic light. At that moment, there are three factors that will influence our decision. If the traffic light is red, we will stand still and wait. If it is yellow, we will be careful and if it is green, we will cross the street. This thought process can also be attributed to a computer based on a condition under which our computer will execute various possible instructions. Suppose we have a scanner that will ask the user to enter his age and depending on the answer, the computer will inform us if the user is an adult or a minor. We will have a scanner reader equals new scanner system dot in. We will have to import the scanner class from the package java.util and we will display a corresponding message. System out, print line, please enter your age. The age will be encapsulated in a variable int age, which will be equal to reader next int. If the computer decides that I'm an adult, I want an appropriate message to be printed. You are an adult. How can the computer decide this? Using the if statement. We will write if and open two parentheses. Between those two parentheses, we will have our condition. The condition is that the age is greater than or equal to 18. So we will write if age greater than or equal to 18, then we will open a block of code. We open those brackets and then press enter. The closing bracket was automatically generated. Here I will display the message. System out print line, you are an adult. Let's display a message at the end. We will write system out print line outside my if block of code in which I will say the program is over. We will run the application. The program will ask us to enter our age, 17. My condition has not been met. My age is not greater than or equal to 18. Therefore, the block of code between those two braces was not executed. And my program went ahead and printed the program is over. Let's run our application again. If we enter an age older than 18, we will enter 19. Now, if I press enter, the program will show us that we are adults. My condition that the age is greater than or equal to 18 was evaluated as true. Therefore, the code block between these two braces was executed. Furthermore, the program went its own way and printed the last message. The program is over. This is the if statement. In its parentheses, we will always have a condition that will return a boolean. This condition will be either true or false. If my condition is true, then what I passed in this block of code will be executed. It's that simple. Otherwise, it will not run and move on. If my condition is false, then this block of code will not run and the application will move on. Suppose I will also like my program to print if I'm a minor. We could do another if statement. We could write if age is less than 18, then I will open another block of code in which I can print system out print line, you're a minor. Let's run the application. If we run the program and enter a number less than 18, let's say 16, we will have this message printed, you're a minor. We did this logic using two if instructions. The if statement can also have an else branch, a branch that will be executed when our condition is evaluated as false. Instead of having another if that checks the other condition so that my age is less than 18, I will delete this and I can pass an else branch to my if. I can write else, open again a block of code, and here I will move my system out print line instruction. Let's run our application. We can see that if we enter a small age, let's say 12, 
the program printed that we are a minor. On the other hand, if we enter, let's say, 22, then you're an adult. The else branch was executed if my condition was evaluated as false. Let's comment our block of code. We will leave just the scanner. Let's enter from the keyboard the color of the traffic light we talked about at the beginning of the video. We will write string color equals reader dot next line. If our traffic light is red, then we will stay put. We will write a check. If the color would be equal to red, I will write color red and you will immediately see why I wrote it in this format. Then we will display a message. System out print line, we are waiting. You can see that inside my condition, I did not use the operator equals equals. Why? I will only use the equals equals operator when I want to check the equality of two numeric values. If I have to check the equality of two strings, I will have to use a method of the string class. That is the equals method. My check will look like this. I will write color dot equals and I will open parentheses. This text red will be moved here. My instruction will read as follows. If the color of the traffic light is equal to the text red, then I will print we are waiting. Before running the application, we must display a corresponding message at the beginning. We will write system out print line, please enter the color of the traffic light. I will run my application and I will enter red. We can see that we are waiting. If I had used the equals equals operator, then this would have not worked. Let's test it. I will enter the same text red and we can see that nothing happened. So we will leave it as I initially wrote it. We can see that based on our traffic light, our decision will be made depending on several factors. I will have three different cases in which the traffic light will be red, yellow, and green. We can also chain several conditions, one after the other. Here, at the end of this block of code, I can write else if and open parentheses. Here I will pass the other condition. If the color of the traffic light is equal to yellow, then I will open another block of code in which I will print we are careful. We can also add another else if. Else if, parentheses, our color is equal to green, then we will print a corresponding message, system out print line, we cross the street. Let's run our application. I will introduce red. My first condition was evaluated true, so the code I had in the first block of code was executed and the other else if conditions were not even taken into account. Let's run again. If I enter yellow, the message we are careful will be displayed. The first check was made in the if statement the first time. Our traffic light was not red, so the condition was asserted as false. If the condition was false, our compiler will proceed to the next check. It will be checked if the color of our traffic light is yellow. If it is indeed yellow, then the second block of code will be executed, and the last check will not even be taken into account. Now let's run again. Also let's enter green. Doing so, the message we cross the street will be printed. The first time, the compiler checked if the traffic light was red and it was false. Therefore, the first block of code was not executed. It moved on to the next check. It was yellow, not. 
Therefore, the second block of code was also not executed. We moved on to the next check, which this time returned true. My traffic light was indeed green, so this block of code was executed. Let's run our application again. If I enter anything else other than green, red or yellow, I'll have a problem. If I enter orange, I can see that my application was finished without even showing me any messages. Here I can write an else branch at the end. I will write else and open a block of code. Here I can print a system out print line. You did not enter a valid traffic light color. Now let's run my application again. Double quotes here. Let's run my application again. If we now run the application and enter any other value than red, yellow and green, my program will enter the else branch and will tell me that I did not enter a valid color. If I enter purple, I will be able to see a message. After that, my program will end. Java is a case sensitive programming language. I will run my application again. This means that if we run the application again and enter the text red in capital letters, we will be told you did not enter a valid color. Why? The text red written in capital letters will not be equal to the text red written in lowercase. Our equals method will return true if the two texts are identical. Besides the equals method, we also have another method called equals ignore case. Let's change this everywhere. Now I will run my application again. If I write red in capital letters, now my program will display the correct message. To make a recap, when I want to determine the equality of two numbers, I will use the equals equals operator. If I want to find the equality of two strings, I will have to use the equals method. I will write the first text, dot equals, in parentheses to which I will pass the text with which I want my initial text to be compared. This method will return true if the texts are identical. Also, in the case of strings, I will have the equals ignore case method, which this time will not take into account the way our text is written. In the next video, we will do some exercises in which we will use the if else statement. Hello, this is the first video in a series of exercises in which we will practice the if else decision making instructions. Let's start with the first exercise. Write a program that asks the user to enter two numbers and prints if the numbers are equal or not. Pause the video and try, after which we will work together. To read two numbers, we will need a scanner object. We will write scanner and we will import the scanner class. Reader equals new scanner system.in Let's display the following message. System of print line enter the first number. We will store it in a variable of type int number one, which will be equal to our reader dot next int. Next, we'll print the second message. System out print line enter the second number. This number will also be encapsulated in a variable of type int number two, which will be equal also to reader next int. Let's do the check now. We will write if number one is equal to number two, then we will write a system out print line, the numbers are equal. Else, we will write a system out print line, the numbers are not equal. Let's test both our cases. Enter the first number. 
22, the second number also 22. The numbers are equal. We will rerun the application, we will enter 22 and 23. The numbers are not equal. Let's comment on everything we've written so far and move on to the next exercise. Write a program that asks the user for a number and prints if the number is odd or even. As a hint, to determine the parity of a number, we can use the modulo operator. If that number modulo 2 is equal to 0, it means that the number is even. Pause the video and try to solve the exercise, after which we will write the code together. Again, to read information from the console, we will need a scanner. Scanner sc equals new scanner system.in. Let's display a message. System out print line, enter a number. We will enter it and we will encapsulate it in a variable of type int. Number which will be equal to sc.nextInt. After that, we will write the verification. If number modulo 2 is equal to 0, that means that the number is even. So we will write a system of print line, the number is even. Else, that means that the number is not even. So we will write a system of print line, the number is odd. Let's test our two cases. The message enter a number was displayed. We enter 12. The number is even. Let's rerun the application. We will enter 99. The number is odd. We can see that it works. Let's comment the exercise and we will move on to the next one. Write a program that asks the user for a number and prints if that number is positive or negative. Pause the video and try, after which we will write the exercise together. We will need a scanner again. We will write scanner sc equals new scanner system.in and we will display a message. System out print line, please provide a number. Our number will be encapsulated in a variable of type int number, which will be equal to my sc dot next int. Now let's do our check. If that number is less than zero, then I will print the following message. The number is negative. On the other hand, if the number is not less than zero, that means that the number is positive. Let's test both our cases. Please provide a number. I will enter 15. The number is positive. Again, please provide a number. Minus 22. The number is negative. Let's comment this exercise and move to the next one. Write a program that asks the user for three numbers and prints which number is the smallest. Pause the video and try, after which we will solve the exercise together. First, we will need a scanner. Scanner reader equals new scanner system.in. We will now print three messages. System out print line, please enter the first number. Also, we will copy and paste this message two times. Please enter the second number and the third number. My first number will be encapsulated in a variable of type int first, which will be equal to my reader dot next int. I will do that also for the second and the third number. int second equals reader dot next int and also int third equals reader dot 
next int. Now we will have to decide which number is the small. To do this exercise, we will define a flag. A flag is an initial assumption. We will assume that the first number we entered will be the smallest. We will declare an int smallest equals my first number. After that, we will write some if statements. We are going to compare our smallest variable with the other two numbers. We will write if the second is less than the smallest, that means that the smallest will become the second number. Else if my third number is less than the smallest, then my smallest number will become the third number. At the end, all that remains is to print a message. System out print line, the smallest provided number is plus smallest. Let's test all of our cases. I will enter 12, 33 and 50. The smallest provided number is 12. I will enter 10, 2 and 100. The smallest is 2, my second one. And also I will enter 2, 2 and 1. The third provided number is the smallest. Let's comment our exercise and move on to the next one. Write a program that asks the user to enter his or her age and the age he or she wants to retire. The program will either print you still got x more years to work or you already retired y years ago. Also, the age the user entered must be valid. A valid age is between 18 and 99. Pause the video and try, after which we will solve the exercise together. First, we will need a scanner. We will write scanner reader equals new scanner system dot in. Let's enter our age. First, we will display a message. Please enter your age. My age will be encapsulated in an int variable, int age equals reader dot next int. And I will also ask the user to provide his retiring age. What age do you want to retire? int retire age will be equal again to reader dot next int. First, I will have to check if the provided numbers are valid. We can write if age is less or equal to zero or the retire age is less or equal to zero then I will have a system out print line. You have entered a negative age. Now I will check if the user entered an age above 100. Else if age is greater or equal to 100 or retire age is greater or equal to 100. Again, I will print a message. System out print line. You cannot enter an age above 100. If we have not violated the conditions of our application, then we will move on to calculate the difference between the two ages. We will have an else branch. In this branch, we will compare the ages. We will write if age is less than the retire age, that means we we'll still have some work to do. We will write a system of print line. You still have to work plus retire age 
minus age plus years. If the age is not less than the retire age, it means that we already retired. System of print line, you already retired plus age minus retire age years ago. Let's test all three of our cases. In fact, there are four. Please enter your age, 33 minus 2. You have entered a negative number. Please enter your age, 33, 1000. You cannot enter an age above 100. Again, I'm 32 years old. I want to retire by the time I'm 45. You still have to work 13 years. Now, let's see when we're already retired. I'm 62 and I want to retire at 45. You already retired 17 years ago. In the next video, we will continue with the if-else exercises.